Peter Obermuller with the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Appreciate you joining the program here today. How about we start off by a little state of the union, except state of Wyoming. Where, where are we at with the oil and gas world? I've been saying, you know, the BLM has put some sort of ban in with the uh, Wyoming BLM land, but maybe that's not uh, totally accurate. So how about uh, kind of an overview? Yeah, you know, we are, uh, we're doing okay. Uh, in fact, we uh, are you know, sort of slowly and steadily improving from the uh, sort of uh, bottom that we hit about uh, three or four years ago. And uh, so production is, is up uh, over the last couple of years. Um, the rig counts are up uh, and employment is up. Uh, employment just, just slightly. Uh, but uh, but all, all things considered, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, with reference to the BLM uh, that you mentioned, yeah, there, there's some interesting uh, court challenges going on there. It's not a full say of, of a full on ban on drilling on, on, on BLM lands. Uh, it was 300,000 acres, and it was a pause relating to analyzing greenhouse gas emissions uh, that the BLM has rectified. And so uh, it's that's still moving. That's moving forward now. Got an annual meeting coming up, I see, on social media. Talk to me a little bit about the annual meeting. Yeah, I'm excited for it. It's uh, This year it's in Cheyenne, uh, our capital city, and uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. And it's, uh, it's, it's going to be good. Registration is strong, and we have a lot of great uh, speakers lined up, uh, including uh, you know, our governor, Mark Gordon, um, our United States Representative, Liz Cheney, and uh, our keynote speaker is uh, uh, a pollster and big data analyst from Washington, D.C. Her name is Kristen Soltis Anderson, who actually has done a fair amount of work in the uh, public opinion space for energy uh, environment and climate and uh, so we're going to talk about that uh, and, and learn from her hopefully about how to a better message what do you think the number one issue in wyoming is right now in terms of what's the number one thing that you guys need i guess changed or modified in order to get more activity there and what's the number one thing that you guys are finding successful yeah i appreciate that you know i i, I I hate, I hate to hedge, but I, w- I would say there's a few number ones. Uh, we've got a lot of irons in the fire, and uh, one of them is uh, the state of Wyoming is uh, completely altering its permitting process for oil and gas operators in the state. Uh, it's uh, changing uh, pretty fundamentally, and uh, that's uh, ongoing right now. The, the proposed rule is out, and, and will take a few, few months to, to sort, but that's, uh, that's a really big deal for us, obviously. Um, the rest of it is the rest of the number ones are all kind of related to, uh, public lands and, uh, and wildlife issues, uh, really, obviously more than, you know, more than half the state is owned by the federal government, but, um, more than two thirds of the, of the subsurface of the mineral estate is owned by the federal government. So we have a lot of issues related to that. Um, sage grouse is probably top of that list, uh, but also big game mig- migration corridors, uh, and uh, and several others, migratory birds and, and all of that. We, we have uh, a lot of issues related to federal lands that uh, private land states uh, don't have to think about as much. Sage grouse, huh? So yeah. That's, uh, that, that's a big one in North Dakota, too. Yeah, it is. Uh, there's, uh, it's, the, the bird was... Um, uh, was uh, kind of on the short track, I guess, uh, could be said for uh, for listing on the Endangered Species Act. Um, Wyoming, there's sage grouse in, in, in all these sort of mountain west states and, and, and going further, further east in North Dakota, but Wyoming is really kind of ground zero. We have probably the biggest and most highly concentrated populations in the states and, uh, and, and the most area affected. So uh, an endangered species listing of the sage grouse would have been uh, catastrophic for oil and gas. So um, the state and uh, oil and gas and lots of other players um, um, dating back all the way to the to the Friedenthal administration, um, two governors ago worked on a state specific conservation plan um, that has uh, has not been without hiccups, but has largely worked and has kept the bird off the list. Um, so we still have some challenges with implementation, uh, but it is considering the alternative. It's uh, it's been going okay. 
How's the water world in Wyoming? The water world Wyoming, yeah. I mean, it's, it's much like, you know, most rocky areas where your water is very uh, abundant in some areas and non-existent in others. Yeah, that pretty well describes it. Yeah, I mean, so how, how, how does that work in Wyoming when it comes to... And the reason I ask is, like, in the Bakken in North Dakota, you know, shortly after the energy boom happened, they came out and said, geez, we're going to need 10 times the amount of water that we thought we were going to need. They Similar down in the Permian as well. And every time I think of, you know, some of these Mountain West states, you know, there's reservoirs there for a reason. You know, California complains they don't have enough water for a reason. You know, I mean, there's... there's, there's there's only enough to go around, and, and certain math equations need to be done. So if someone forgets to carry the one, whether it's city or state or a regulator, whatever it might be, um, it affects everybody. You know. So yeah. how, how, how's the water world in Wyoming? Long way to ask that question. <laughs> no, it's, it's helpful, and I'd, I'd actually be interested in learning more about, about the water challenges in the block, and that would be a helpful exercise for me. But you know it's it is as you described it's a little bit different depending on on on, the, on where you are in wyoming there's a lot of uh of legacy fields uh in the central and uh central west and, and northwest part of the state that that produce a lot of water and uh interestingly they um uh, there's a lot of that produced water in Wyoming that actually ends up being quite beneficial to landowners and, and ag operations in that part of the state. They they uh, they use the, that produced water for uh, for beneficial uses in the Powder River Basin, which is you know where the uh, where the main development is now the the hot item uh, in the Powder River Basin. It's, it's a little bit different story. There's not quite the uh, the water supply there, and so uh, it's uh, it's a little bit more tricky. And a lot of the operators are taking a cue from uh, their work in the Permian, in the sense that they're working pretty hard to uh, implement, develop, and implement complete recycling uh, programs, and uh, you know, try to reduce the amount of of, of fresh water that's necessary. Uh, so it's it, it's a bit of an infrastructure challenge there, but I think we'll uh, we'll overcome it. How about the reuse and the recycled part of the water? You mentioned that, you know, the repurposing. I would imagine that um, there would be quite a bit of innovation or at least some some talk of it within the state, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, in terms of the of the recycle and reuse from an, from an industry standpoint, that's pretty much private sector led. That's mm-hmm. uh, industry working on that. It's the because the Powder River Basin is where the majority of our rigs are uh, and where most of the new production is, there's a little bit of a renewed focus on this issue uh, within uh, policymakers, um, uh, among policymakers, I should say. So uh, there is a lot of interest in that. And uh, it's really kind of uh, the PRB is still, um, you know, especially in comparison to Bakken or Permian, of course, is still is very new. So that uh, the, the infrastructure isn't quite built out yet. You mentioned the Powder River Basin. Uh, is that primarily? I mean, that's a natural gas play, isn't it? Mostly, or is, or is there other uh, resources that they're getting out of there? No, they're getting they're getting oil out of there. Okay. Um, there is there is natural gas too, of course, but uh, but it is an oil play. It is okay. Uh, what, yeah. what what what's the uh, overview there? I mean, as far as depth and some of the things. Would you happen to know anything like that? I mean, like in the Bakken, they're going going a couple miles deep, and in the Marcellus, they're going fifty feet. <laughs> yeah, it's it, well, yeah, it's not it's not fifty feet. I can promise you that. It's it's more like the it's more like the Bakken. In okay. In terms of the in terms of the depths, um, it may not be quite as deep as that. I'm not totally sure. The fact actually, the fact of the matter is there's. Maybe this is true in the Bakken. You have to tell me. But uh, in the PRB, there's there's sort of multiple formations at different depths. Okay. And uh, uh, part of our part of the permitting challenge, of course, is that uh, um, you know you different companies are, are are interested in the different formations, and that that creates a little bit of a challenge in terms of, of making sure we organize all of this. But um, but none of them, none of the active formations that are producing uh, oil are, are uh, any sort of shallow operations. These are, these are deep, well, horizontal uh, plays. 
Peter Obermuller with us, president of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Are you guys seeing a lot of uh, activity in the in, in the Bakken still from from your companies and some of your uh, whether it be uh, you know, service providers or providers that sort of thing? I don't know how how closely you keep uh, your, your finger on that pulse or not, but it just seems you know between the DJ and the Permian and the Bakken and even up in the oil sands, a lot of these companies are doing business in multiple shale plays. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true here. Uh, you know, we have uh, several uh, shared members between the Petroleum Association of Wyoming and the North Dakota Petroleum Council. Uh, a lot of, uh, e- even some uh, individuals who are on, you know, each of our leadership teams. Uh, so that is, uh, um, uh, there, there is some overlap there. It's actually pretty helpful. Uh, there's, uh, I'm sure that you've probably uh, uh, talked to Ron Ness over there at, at NDPC, but uh, they're a very professional operation of uh, nothing but, uh, but uh, respect for what they're up to and trying to model a lot of what we do uh, after what they do. And it helps to have uh, shared membership that can uh, help cross-pollinate some of these some of these good ideas you know during the to, more specifically to your question when we when we experienced a pretty uh, severe downturn a few uh, about three or four years ago uh, the Bakken was still uh, was going gangbusters and uh, so a lot of companies in Wyoming uh, particularly the ones located in Gillette and in and around the PRB uh, focused almost all of their attention on the Bakken and, and you know we've had you know, there's there's uh, several there's lots of companies and, and lots of people who commute back and forth to work up there. That may change as PRB takes off a little bit more, but uh, but there's a lot of interplay between the two states and the two uh, the two basins. Colorado has been having some issues, uh, so much to where the governors said the war on oil and gas has that uh, impacted. Any, any of your members or are you hearing, I'm sure you're hearing much about it, just kind of from your perspective and your catbird seat, what are you seeing? Yeah, it's interesting to watch our neighbors to the south uh, and, um, take the turn that they have, uh, particularly given how, uh, how productive and how uh, helpful to the state in a lot of ways that uh, that DJ Basin uh, play was for them. So they're, they're still a long ways from figuring it all out. They, I, I can't remember the total number, but, um, you know, a, couple, a dozen or more different rulemakings that they still have to do and, and, uh, and, and all of that. So we haven't seen a, um, an immediate uh, influx, uh, though there have been a couple of companies who had previously moved out of Wyoming who have moved back in uh, as a direct result uh, of the of the of what's happening in Colorado. I think it's sort of what we talked about before. Um, uh, you know, for Wyoming, our biggest barrier to entry is the difficulty of dealing with the federal government and, and federal lands. So uh, it's not as though looking north to Wyoming is an immediate. Uh, a fix for folks. They have to. They really have to ramp up their operations to in sort of a different way to deal with deal with federal lands and federal owned minerals. Uh, but I, I think we're seeing it, and we're going to see it continue. If uh, particularly depending on how these rulemakings turn out down there. Kind of circling back to the annual meeting to kind of recap that a little bit. Uh, uh, when is the dates again? Some of the topics that you guys are going to be talking about. If there's any. Um, speakers or sponsors anything like that you you want to mention just kind of take the time to recap that a little bit and uh, give you guys a a plug there at the petroleum association of wyoming yeah thanks i appreciate it yeah it's uh it is august 19th and 20th uh here in in cheyenne uh wyoming's capital and uh the 19th we'll uh, be doing a little fundraising uh playing golf and and, and shooting a little trap uh, for fundraising and then we have a uh, a welcome reception at the governor's mansion that evening. And then uh, the next day is really the, the meeting proper. And I'm pretty excited for it. Uh, three general sessions uh, and then several breakout sessions. Uh, the general sessions, we have um, Casey Hammond, who's uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Lands and Minerals at the Department of Interior. And we'll, we'll be speaking to the uh, to the members and uh, U.S. Representative Liz Cheney, our House Representative from Wyoming, 
Uh, we're also going to uh, talk a lot about um, uh, the presentation from uh, some government agencies and some other entrepreneurs here in Wyoming that are uh, working to develop uh, recruitment tools for and, and financing for um, oil and gas startups in Wyoming, which I'm really excited about uh, the opportunity to, to partner with them. Uh, and I'll be uh, making an announcement about that partnership at the meeting uh, to help uh, incentivize and foster um, new businesses and, and, and entrepreneurship and startups in the oil and gas space, uh, help sort of drive forward what's next in oil and gas. So that'll be a fun one. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and then a lot breakout sessions on a lot of topics, ranging from uh, uh, other recruitment issues. Our unemployment rate in Wyoming is 3.5 percent, so we have workforce issues like uh, certainly like the Bakken. So we're going to uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll be talking to some legislators uh, and uh, hearing about Wyoming's budget uh, uh, and budget crunch issues, uh, taxation in Wyoming, and uh, uh, several other. Uh, topics uh, um, uh, on the docket for those breakouts and then uh, the governor at the chairman's dinner that that night so it should be a good uh, one day event and uh, registration is strong though uh, still uh, open for registration for another week or so so um, would love to have even more